If you would take your Bibles uh, with us this morning and turn to the book of Philippians, chapter number 3. Uh, Philippians chapter number 3 is uh, where we'll be this morning and trust that God would uh, speak to our hearts from his word and encourage us and help us today and uh, trust that you've come ready to receive uh, what God has in store for us this morning. So Philippians 3, we're going to be in verses 12 uh, through verse 16. So again, that's Philippians chapter 3, beginning there in verse 12. The Bible says, Paul writing here, not that I have already obtained this, Or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the gospel and the goal, rather, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature, think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather, Lord, in uh, the house of worship this morning and be with your people and uh, to be able to uh, devote ourselves to the uh, the reading of the word and through singing and giving and praying and uh, Lord fellowship and the, the ministry of the word of God this morning to our hearts. So Father, uh, as we've done that, Lord, we pray that you would bless our efforts, Lord, that you'd help uh, strengthen and encourage and motivate us, Lord, during this time. Uh, Lord, we pray that if anybody that's uh, listening to the message this morning, whether uh, in person or through a uh, live stream this uh, morning, Father, that you just uh, help them to, uh, by faith, come to trust in you, Lord, and give their lives to you. So, God, we just pray that your will would be in our hearts and in our in our lives, that we'd, we'd give you the honor and glory that you're due. For it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, There's an old children's story that's been around for quite some time. In fact, uh, it's been around a very long time and has been kind of redone throughout the years uh, called the Tortoise, uh, the tortoise rather, uh, and the and the hare. And I've been nervous all morning that I was going to mispronounce that. And there we go. So maybe I can just call it a turtle, but that suffice, uh, and uh, and let everybody be all right with that. But the the idea is that the hare uh, is uh, kind of parading in his arrogancy uh, that you know he's faster than everybody else, better than everybody else, and there's nobody that can match his skill or his ability. Uh, and the tortoise is just uh, tortoise rather, however you say it, is uh, has just gotten fed up with it. Uh, And so he challenges him to a race. And uh, so they set the race up and uh, there uh, is even given a a, a little bit of of an advantage to the turtle because the the hare thinks he's that much quicker. So they start about the race and uh, the hare goes around doing all kinds of things, showing off and uh, getting sidetracked and getting distracted and going this place and going that place. And what you see the tortoise doing uh, is uh, just steady, slowly but surely going toward the finish line and uh, what happens in the end is that the tortoise is the one that wins Uh, and we could draw many applications from that there's many people that have philosophied over the uh, the uh, uh, the meaning of that folklore and what it had to do but I just draw the application that uh, the the winning a race doesn't necessarily uh, come down to who's the most talented Uh, winning a race doesn't always to come down to the one who has the best advantage Uh, sometimes uh, the race comes down to the one that runs the race the best, the one that has the most things go right for them, the one that maybe isn't uh, arrogant in their efforts and just slowly but surely goes toward the finish line. When our passage this morning here in Philippians chapter number three, we see a, a uh, an example given by the Apostle Paul in that same line of thinking of racing and uh, is kind of an instructive um, uh, recipe uh, for how Paul... Uh, ordered his own life and the resolutions that he had made to make sure that he continued to grow spiritually and that as he got to the end of his life and he was focused on the finish line that he would be able to cross it and uh, cross it well now I'm not going to this morning uh, uh, 
want us to think in any way that we are uh, in a competition with each other in racing, but we are in a competition uh, with ourselves. And throughout the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is uh, encouraging the uh, the Philippian believers to continue to have joy uh, in spite of all circumstances. He would talk about uh, how people would oppose them and uh, would uh, persecute them. He would talk about the sufferings that they would endure. Uh, he would talk about the uh, inward fighting and uh, the, uh, the, the way that they would sometimes grow disunified and he would talk about uh, the, the temptation of false teaching and getting people to trust in their own righteousness instead of the righteousness that comes by faith through God. That's what he has just talked about in verses 1 through 11 is that don't trust your own works for your salvation. Uh, that's not going to work. The only way a person is made righteous is through faith in Jesus Christ. He said be careful uh, that you don't start placing your emphasis and your faith in yourself, but keep it in God. And in these verses, verse 12 through 16, Paul is going to describe how uh, he, though he is trusting in God for his righteousness, still understands that he has a role to play in his sanctification, in his growth. You see, salvation is an instant thing. Uh, when a person is made aware of their sin, uh, and they're made aware of the great sacrifice made by their Savior, and they by faith trust in him, instantly uh, they are redeemed. Instantly the inward man is transform instantly uh, they are made right with God that happens at the very moment a person trusts it by faith in Christ but what doesn't happen instantaneously is the sanctification process where uh, between the moment we get saved to the moment that we enter into our eternal destination, uh, there is a growth process that is taking place. There is more to know about God. Uh, there is a better opportunity to love Him deeper. There is more to mature in. There is more to grow in our understanding in. There is more to grow in our relationships with one another. And the Apostle Paul is describing, in essence, uh, what he talked about earlier in Philippians chapter number 2, that we are to work out our own salvation, not to earn salvation, but to again uncover what God has already made us to be. And he's explaining here how he goes through that process of making sure that he's able to work out his own salvation, to put the effort forth uh, that is required on his behalf to grow in the Lord. And I want this morning, as we look at this passage together, uh, for us to be able to see some resolutions that we can make to continue to grow in our faith, to continue to draw closer to the Lord, and that as we are reaching the point of, of our completed salvation one day, that we will along that way grow uh, in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first resolution that the Apostle Paul makes here is he resolves to be dissatisfied. He resolves to be dissatisfied. If you look at Verse 12 with me, I'll show you what Paul is talking about here. He says, not that I have uh, already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now he says that I'm not pretending in any way that I have already obtained this. Now what is this? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul talks about. In verse number 11, if you'll look back there, uh, he says that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He, he is not saying that hopefully I'll be saved. Uh, he knows that he's saved, but he's talking about that I will get to the place, that I will uh, come to the completion of my salvation and knowing the Lord and the fullness of all that he has in store for me uh, in my relationship with him. He was speaking of this idea that Paul understood that he was not yet in heaven. Uh, he understood that his satis uh, salvation was not yet complete. He was making the statement that, look, I have trusted Christ for my salvation and my righteousness. I have put aside all the things that I could claim for my own to, uh, to, to get me to a place where I'm right before God. But don't have the imagination that I'm perfect. Uh, I don't have any feelings that I am uh, where I need to be with the Lord. He said, I still have some room to grow. I still have a long way to go before I know Christ the way I want to know Him. I have a long way to go before I love God the way that God wants me to love Him. 
And for believers, we have to understand that there is a, a, a danger for you and I to grow complacent uh, in our relationship with the Lord. That there is a danger that we can grow satisfied with how far we've come and grow comfortable with where we are. And that is dangerous. I remind you of what the Apostle Paul would write to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verses 12 through 13. Uh, he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed uh, lest he fall. And talks about the temptation that is common to man. His uh, word of warning there is for a believer that is at a place where they think they are above temptation. Temptation. For a believer that thinks they've come to the place that they don't have to stand on guard or be worried about or be concerned about or be praying about or preparing for a temptation to come, you better beware because that's the time that you're going to fall. And we could look throughout human history and gain illustration after illustration to prove that. Uh, but let's be honest about our own lives to realize that there are times in our Christian lives where we are uh, satisfied with where we are with the, hey, we're doing pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in church regularly. I'm reading my Bible regularly. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing and we grow comfortable with where we are and that places us in a point that we can uh, easily fall and we can start going backwards in our faith but more, most, uh, most likely we're not going forward in our faith with the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And there's a couple of temptations I'd like to draw your attention to as we think about this is uh, uh, the temptation to think that we're okay uh, because we are further along than we were years ago. Uh, everybody in there here this morning is at a different point in their spiritual journey unless you just happen to be the same exact age and have experienced all the same experiences and got saved on the same exact day and had all the experiences since then uh, we're all at different places in our spiritual journeys along the uh, paths that we're on and it's very easy uh, to look back at life to look back at uh, how far God has brought us along to realize or to, or to begin to think that man God has brought me a long way I think I'll just settle in here at this point along the journey and be satisfied and comfortable with where I'm at. But I remind you of the transition that had taken place in the Apostle's life and uh, the book of Acts. You can read about this when he was confronted with uh, his sin by the Lord Jesus Christ and he was saved. The transition that took place is he stopped comparing himself uh, to the wicked people that were around him, the heathens that did not know Christ. He stopped comparing himself uh, to the Jewish people that were not as religious as he was and he stopped comparing himself to himself and started comparing comparing himself to Jesus. And he said, Jesus is the standard for holiness. And because I'm not there, and I'll never be there, I need Jesus' righteousness and not my own. I need to trust in Him to do for me what I cannot do for myself. But on the flip side of salvation, what often happens is we quit comparing ourselves to Jesus, thinking, hey, that's a high and lofty standard, and we once again begin comparing ourselves to those that are around us. Hey, I'm not as bad as those in my neighborhood or that I work with or in my family or maybe even in my own church. Uh, I, I'm not not as bad as I once was. Look at how far I came. Look at all the progress that happened. And, and it causes us to grow uh, complacent in our lives to where we are not willing or, or, or ready to keep growing in the Lord. And we become satisfied. But there's another temptation on the flip side of that that many people often struggle with is the temptation to become too dissatisfied. Where it's a constant a uh, boxing match between you and yourself and every single day uh, you're, you're throwing this punch and that punch, reminding yourself of the sin that you struggle with and the things that you're going through. And you're so dissatisfied uh, with the lack of progress in your life that you've hindered yourself from making uh, any progress. So I do want to give that word of warning to not be too dissatisfied with where you are. We're going to piggyback a little bit off of the uh, athletic illustration that the Apostle Paul uses in this passage. There are many, many uh, examples throughout athletic history where a team or an individual, an athlete, has become satisfied with where they have gotten to in their particular sport. They think, hey, uh, look at all the records I hold, look at all the championships we've won, look at all the, uh, the, the accolades that we have, and so they stop 
putting as much effort into practice. Uh, they stop putting as much effort into preparing and learning and studying the opponent and, and doing all the things they have to do to prepare. And before long, they start going downhill. Uh, and and uh, they're not the team they used to be. They're not the athlete they used to be. They, they're beaten by teams or people that should not, by any measure, stand up to them. Because it doesn't matter what the paper says, it matters what happens when you're on the field and you're putting the effort forth. But on the flip side of that, I've been a part of teams that lost the game before we ever stepped onto the court. Because we were so convinced that the other team was so much better than us, and we were so convinced that no matter what effort we put into it, we were not going to win the game, that there was no need to even play the game. And the same thing is true in our lives spiritually, that we have the temptation to get too high on ourselves, and we have the temptation to get too low on ourselves, and the end result is always the same, that we're not growing in the Lord the way that we need to be growing in the Lord. And what we must remember is there is a healthy dose of dissatisfaction, knowing that I'm not perfect, knowing that I, I haven't arrived, but I'm making sure that I don't go on the deep end of that to, I'm not, uh, to where I'm not too, uh, where I'm too dissatisfied with life. The reality of it is there may be somebody that's listening today again whether in person or in live stream that uh, as they have uh, sought to pursue God's work in their lives they've grown d- extremely dissatisfied because it doesn't matter how much effort they put forth or or what what book of the Bible they read or what service they go to or what church they go to they're never able to come to a a, a place where they are at, at all satisfied with where they are and I must remind us this morning that Paul is coming at this from the perspective uh, that the salvation process has already taken place that transformation has already happened and it is a great thing that a person that is not yet in the faith has not gotten to a place of satisfaction uh, at any point because they're realizing their sin. But the next resolution that Paul gives us here, I think, helps us understand how we uh, uh, avoid growing dissatisfied too much or growing satisfied uh, in our faith, and that is to resolve to always look ahead. Resolving to always look ahead. I want to draw your attention back to verse 13 uh, in verse number 14. The Apostle Paul would say here, Brothers, I, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but um, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And this is the second time in this passage that the Apostle Paul uh, uses the word I'm pressing on, I'm looking forward to. Paul has his mind and his eyes set on the things that are before him. What's before him? Well... He's looking forward to the day that he completes his race. Uh, he's looking forward to the day that God calls him home and he's standing face to face before God. And uh, all of the trials and tribulations of this life are over. Uh, all of the, the um, earthly separation, not being in God's presence physically, uh, is going to be over. Having to put all the effort forth that he had uh, made in his life and, and all of the, the punishment that came along with that. And all of the uh, growth that he had, he's looking forward to the day that he's in heaven. He's looking forward to attaining the prize that he talked about where Jesus in his grace and mercy hands us the reward of heaven and reigning with him for all uh, of eternity. And understanding that he's not there yet, but he makes sure that he's keeping his mind and his eyes forward. That he's looking forward to what God has in store. He understands Uh, that there is a danger when running that if we're not looking forward, we're going to be tripped up over something. And I believe this is key to helping us be a a healthy dose of dissatisfied because the first temptation is to be tripped up over our past failures, okay, over our past sin, over our past frustrations and things that if we could, we would go back in an instant change and allow them to be different. Think about Paul. Yes, he is a, 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 a preacher. He is an apostle. Uh, he's a missionary. He's a proclaimer of Christ. Can you imagine uh, how much temptation was in Paul's life to grieve and mourn and regret and be frustrated 
over every single believer that he, either by his own action or by in support, saw lose their lives because they believed in the same name he's still preaching now. Can you imagine how many nights, and the Bible doesn't say this, this could be the thorn in the flesh that Paul talks about, I don't know. But you don't know either, so my idea is just as good as yours, right? How many nights the Apostle Paul would have gone to bed and as he tried to close his eyes and go to sleep, a picture of Stephen laying there or kneeling there praying to God and those stones crashing in on him and Saul over there holding the coats of the ones doing the action. How many times that button might have been pressed to play in his head? But what Paul is saying here is that he understands that the grace of God is real in his life and he is not going to allow his past failures to keep him from growing in the Lord today. If you look with, with me at what he said there, it's simple. In verse number 13, go to the middle section. He says, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward. This idea of forgetting is not that he has some kind of spiritual amnesia where he just simply cannot remember what he used to do. It is the idea that he has willingly uh, chosen to believe God's merciful forgiveness and to not hold it to his own charge and to move forward with it. And I understand this morning that as believers, as we are trying to pursue growth, as we're trying to be all that God wants us to be, as we're trying to know Him better and grow in our faith and be uh, what, what the Bible would describe as a follower of Jesus and grow in the faith that the past is sometimes the greatest obstacle that you and I face. I can't believe that I did the things that I did or, or, or the, the devil will come up and remind us, Look, there's no way you can be used of God because of the things that you have done or not done and those things are flashing in our minds and our, he in our heads and we need to resolve with the Apostle Paul look I'm not going to allow those things in my past to keep me from being what God wants me to be today Reminds you of what uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 103 uh, verses 8 through 14 the Bible says here that the Lord is compassionate and merciful slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love he will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For His unfailing love toward those who fear Him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows that we are only dust. Can I remind you also this morning of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all un righteousness look god is not holding your past sin that is under the blood against you he's not reminding you of it he's not accusing you of it he's not holding it to your charge and we must by faith trust and believe that our sins are forgiven and they are not hindering us from knowing the fullness of christ today but the apostle paul didn't just have his past failures to trip him up he often had his own past successes if you look back through the Apostle Paul, you could think about the books that were written. You could think about the sermons that were preached. You could think about the souls that were saved, the churches that were planted, uh, the lives that were changed. And it would, have been, it would have been easy for Paul to allow himself to look back again at all the things that he had done for God and allow a sense of arrogancy or a sense of pride or a sense of... Uh, Look what I have done in my life. But the Apostle Paul chose not to remember those things, not to allow those to influence his decisions today. And he said that I will not allow the good things in my life that I've experienced to keep me from experiencing more of those good things. 
And you may say, Brother Daniel, you just repeated yourself with point number one, to resolve to be dissatisfied and to resolve to look forward. No, I'm not repeating myself because the first point was a reminder of not to be satisfied with where you are now. The second point is a reminder to not be too satisfied or dissatisfied with where you've been. Because if we've been satisfied or dissatisfied with where we've been, we're most certainly going to be satisfied or dissatisfied with where we are now. But if we can hold the past in proper perspective and still desire to reach forward with more, we're not going to be uh, at an unhealthy balance of our satisfaction with where we are now. I used the illustration, and I believe it's the last sports illustration I plan on using today, and I really don't like to use this one because I'm really not a big fan of this guy. But probably one of the greatest quarterbacks through, uh, through number of championships won, number of championships played, number of records hold, number of games won, Uh, unfortunately, is Tom Brady. (laughs) But one thing that we all could admire about an athlete like Tom Brady, if there's anything to admire, is that despite all that success, every single season, he forgot about what happened last year. And you could say it's unhealthy that the day they win the championship, they're already thinking about next championship. But every single season, despite what happened in the past, I believe he's given every ounce of effort, both on the field, both in the locker room, in his uh, diet, in his workout, uh, in his study of the game, every single ounce of effort to be the best he could be in that coming season. And may we as Christians understand that although we may have come a long way, although we might be in a good place, we have to forget about those things and we have to press forward to what God uh, has in store for us today. As a church, we must remember that it's not about what God has done in our past. It's not about uh, the good things or the bad things that have been there. We must keep those in proper perspective and appreciate those for what they are. But we must not uh, allow that to cause us to not be hungering and thirsting for God to do something today in our future that we can grow can i ask you this morning do you really have something to look forward to do you really have heaven as your ultimate goal and prize in life and that relationship with him because so often we can begin to look at the things of earth and grow dissatisfied with them and realize they're not providing anything and with nothing to look forward to all we have to do is look back but thankfully due to the grace of God and the future that he provides we can be looking forward to what God has in store for us so resolving to not be or, or to be dissatisfied healthily resolving uh, to to uh, look forward and the third and final resolve that I believe Paul makes in this passage is a resolve to be single minded if you look back with me in verse number 12 I think I just heard myself talking Is that just me? Okay. All right. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on, and I want you to notice this, to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And then he says, brothers, I do not consider or think that I have made it my own, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, he puts, uh, he uh, he presses on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call that is in uh, Christ Jesus and encourages us all in verse 15, if we're mature in the faith as believers to think this way, and if we think any differently, may God reveal that to us. And then he says to us, only let us hold true to what we have obtained the point that Paul is making through these verses where he instructs us to to obtain something or to attain or to press forward when he talks about the idea that it is not his own but yet he is desiring to make it his own because God has made him his own he's referring to the fullness of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ He's referring to knowing and loving God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds and strengths, the uh, the completion of the work of grace in our lives to where we are fully His and we know Him fully and He is fully ours. We think back to 
What is the process that started that for Paul? It was on that road to Damascus as he was confronted with the light from heaven. Uh, The Lord uh, confronted him with the sin. Paul uh, believed and trusted in Christ as his Savior. And at that moment, God began to, uh, to sanctify and to mature the Apostle Paul. But it is that moment that the grace and the mercy of God gripped the heart of the Apostle Paul. It was a constant amazing wonder that the grace of God, the very God that he was fighting against, that the Lord Jesus, the very one that he was preaching out against, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the very one that he was seeking to destroy his name from the face of the earth, would lovingly and graciously confront him and open up his eyes to the truth of the gospel so that by faith the apostle Paul could be saved. And I believe that based off the account that we have uh, throughout the apostle Paul's life that he never lost the wonder of what God did for him. He never lost the wonder that God would save a wretched sinner or the chief of sinners as he would describe himself And he never lost the wonder that he now had the opportunity to be on the Lord's side. If you were to dissect the life of Paul the Apostle, you would understand that his life's mission, his life's goal, his life's concern, his life's thought process was solely the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ had come to save sinners. And everything he did, every message he preached, every thought that he had, every relationship he enjoyed, every court appearance he had, it all went back to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I remind us this morning that in our process of sanctification, in our desire to grow, in our desire to know God more, in our desire to love Him more, uh, as our desire to serve Him more goes through, we must keep the gospel as our central focus. That we must keep the grace of God as the primary uh, thought in our mind, as the primary desire of our heart, as the primary lens to which we view life. And understanding that when we allow ourselves to get distracted by the cares of this life, we get distracted by earthly pursuits and goals, and we get to a place where we are not keeping the gospel the central thing in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, that we cannot experience the growth that God has for us. Why is this? I believe it's because the more we're able to taste the goodness of God, the more we want. The more we know about God, the more we want to know Him. The more of the love of God we experience, the more we want to be loved by God, and the more we want to in turn love Him and others in the way that He loves us. The more the forgiveness of God that we experience and know, that God has uh, taken our sins as far as the east is from the west, He has chosen to not hold them to our account, He has completely removed them from our charge. The more we do that when we sin on this side of that, the more we want to rush back to God to have Him do the same thing to that sin that we just committed, to forgive it, to remove it, to cleanse us from it. The more we experience God providing in our lives, the more we want God to provide for us, and the more we want to throw ourselves into His trusting and loving arms. The more we see Him work, the more we want to sit back and participate in that and allow God to continue working in us. Use the illustration, uh, just get your thought process in it. Why is good food uh, so hard to quit eating it? Right? I know a lot of foods that are bad for me, but giving me the chance, I'm going to run right to it this afternoon. Because it's good. I enjoy it. All the healthy food is not good. Most of it anyway. But why? Because I like the taste of it. Sure, I don't like the results of it, so it's not a perfect illustration. But I like it, so I keep going back to it. And the Apostle Paul is saying, once you've tasted the gospel, once you've allowed that to be the controlling force of your life and you've, you've experienced that, the more you want it. 
And the more you throw yourself at the mercy of it, but also the more we are aware of it, the more it clarifies other things. I remind you, Paul is writing to us that we may have a persistent joy that continues on through trials and tribulations. A persistent joy that although the world is opposed to us and is persecuting us, we still are able to carry on with joy. That although our brothers and sisters in Christ might be despitefully using us or, 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 or backbiting or, or uh, we're arguing over some silly and small things, you can still have joy. He would tell us in Philippians chapter number 4 that we can still have joy, although we don't have a lot of, of financial resources or a lot of things that we can claim to be comfort and learn to be content through all of that. And here he's saying we can have joy through our faith because of the gospel and how it clarifies all of those things that he talked about. It gives us a lens to view life. In knowing that God loves us, God has forgiven us, God is working a plan that is glorious and far beyond our feeble human comprehension. And so when we see things happening in life, when we see those obstacles come, when we see the past creep up by the devil's accusation against us, and when we see uh, the, 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 the difficulties and even some arrogant pride that comes into our lives, and we're reminding ourselves of the gospel, it helps us to put those things aside. So that we can chase after knowing God better and knowing Him more. James gives us the warning in James chapter number 1 in verse number 8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And for you and I, if if we lose the centrality and the singularity of the gospel as the cornerstone of our minds, we are unstable in our faith. May we commit with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, that I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There used to be a blockbuster store probably in every town across this country, at least of a certain size. There's not many, if any. I don't think there's any blockbusters still around today. They used to share a giant share of the market when it comes to video and game rentals. And I probably, like many of you, and uh, you know, have experienced, and I grew up with it. It was the expectation of, man, you wanted something on a Friday night or a Saturday night. The family went to Blockbuster and uh, got some popcorn and a movie and went home and watched it. Well, what happened? Why isn't Blockbuster here now? Well, a thing called Redbox came along, Netflix came along, where people could rent things pretty easily, pretty quickly, and pretty cheaply. Unless you wait seven or eight days to return it, and then it's more than what Blockbuster was. But I'm not speaking from personal experience on that at all. But I think Blockbuster kind of was comfortable with where they were at. They were looking at their balance sheets when Netflix came along. Some of those crazy people, there's no way they're going to be able to do that. Look at how much money we're making. We're okay. They refused to change their strategy. They refused to allow themselves to see new avenues of growth and new ways that they could actually make a lot more money, saving money on retail stores and employees at those stores. They were pretty complacent. Blockbusters no more. And I'm not saying this morning that we are in danger of not being Christians anymore. As much as I am saying that we all stand in perilous danger of a week building upon a week, building upon a month, building upon a year of stagnant spiritual growth. Where we honestly can't look back in the last year, five years, ten years, and see any measure of progress. And the danger is, is that some could look at that lack of progress and say, well, I'm still in a pretty good spot. But what the Apostle Paul is asking us to do this morning, along with him, is to resolve to not be satisfied with where we are but to realize how much further we have to go. How much more room there is to add to our faith. 
the more room there is to grow in our relationship with the Lord. To always be looking forward to what God has in store. And to always, always, always keep the amazing gospel message at the forefront of our minds, never losing our sense of wonder and awe that God would love us enough to send His Son to die on the cross so that we might be saved. And that through that great love, I desire a deeper understanding, a deeper experience, and a deeper knowledge of that word. You may ask, Brother Daniel, what can I do to put into practice what you've said today or what the Scripture has said? I want to first encourage you to seek the Lord through prayer. To ask Him to reveal to you, as the Apostle Paul said in verse 15, that God would reveal to you, if you have a different mindset than this, God, would you reveal to us where we are spiritually and where we need to grow? I would encourage you to continue practicing the spiritual disciplines. Keep praying. Keep reading the Bible. Keep uh, giving. Keep coming to church. Keep serving. Keep doing what God has asked and called us to do. Keep loving one another. And I believe that the more we do that, the more we'll see a sense of dissatisfaction with where we are in a healthy way, and the more we'll desire to grow. And and I believe also, finally, what we see is that, that you and I should surround ourselves with some godly people that can encourage us to grow, that can motivate us to grow, that maybe are a little further along, and not that we want to grow jealous of that, or not that we want to start comparing ourselves to that, but to Kind of allow them to wear off on us a little bit. If you want to know a little bit more of that, I encourage you to read verse 17 down to the end of the chapter. And I hope next week, by God's grace, we'll be able to show you how we could have some good, godly, spiritual uh, heroes in our lives. So my last encouragement this morning to you is let's pray for one another. As fellow believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God would help us to keep pressing on. For the prize of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ.